You're in the water loop. <laughs> Welcome to Waterloop, the podcast exploring solutions for sustainability and equity in water. I'm the host, Travis Loop. This is episode number 195, Adventures in Hydrology. Time spent exploring outdoors can provide the best perspective on the state of our water world. This episode delves into the remarkable lessons offered by the mountains and rivers of Colorado, Insights shared by Chris Wolf on his Adventure Hydrology Instagram page. Chris takes us through the observations and transformations he's witnessed during his hikes, rafting excursions, and skiing adventures amidst the Rocky Mountains. Additionally, he sheds light on his prior contributions to water conservation efforts at the Eagle River Water and Sanitation District as well as his current role dedicated to advancing sustainability in the Colorado River Basin with Quantified Ventures. Before starting, I want to tell you about this episode's sponsor, Flume Utility and Business Solutions. I have a flume system at my house to track water use in real time and show me what's happening on my smartphone. Flume also provides crucial insights to water providers and state and regional planning agencies enabling them to conserve water, stop leaks, plan for the future, comply with regulations, and so much more. Flume is partnering with leading water utilities across the country, such as the San Antonio Water System, Orange County Municipal Water District, and East Bay Municipal Utilities District. Flume's nationwide network of sensors collect residential water use data at five second intervals. It provides detailed analysis of how water is used indoors and out, even down to the fixture level. To learn more, visit flumewater.com and please reach out to their team at partnerships at flumewater.com. You're in the water loop. Chris, excited to finally get a podcast with you. I think we've been in touch for, I don't know, a couple years on social media, especially Instagram. Uh, so it's awesome to chat. I'll, I'll say, first of all, people have got to follow Adventure Hydrology on Instagram. Uh, really, really good stuff. But how are you doing? I'm doing very well. Uh, Colorado's beautiful this time of year. Doing a lot of fun things during the week, but really the weekends are kind of where I get to play the most, the hardest. That's uh, yeah, kind of where, where yeah. I'm at now. Doing great. How are you doing today, Travis? I'm good. I'm good. You know, we we're just talking about our, you know, you're in the mountains. I'm I'm by the sea, right? We have at, at opposite ends of the uh, the water cycle in a way. <laughs> You've got it where it falls down. <laughs> It's that surf and turf, I love it. I love it. Yeah. Um, so I'm. I've been enjoying waves from a hurricane here on the coast of North Carolina. I know you're always getting out in the woods and hiking around. So it's a. Uh, and I'm jealous too. You know, like I love the life I live in the ocean, but I'm always like, man, you are in some awesome mountains, beautiful rivers. Uh, just you know, what's that like being there in Colorado? I would say Colorado is probably my favorite state i actually you know what there, there's so many great states Ooh. and there's so many great environments and ecosystems and, and things to do in each one that they're all mm. really unique but colorado for me really kind of sings to my soul it's uh, got all the fun stuff i don't i don't really see seasons anymore as mm. spring summer fall winter i see them as what kind of adventure i can do so spring is whitewater rafting fall is leaf peeping and prime mountain climbing season Summertime is camping season, or I do a lot of trail running, mountain biking, uh, road biking. And then winter, of course, is skiing, Nordic, backcountry, anything that deals with snow. Yeah. So that's the way, uh, the way Colorado works for me. <laughs> yeah, where I live, I have to wait to hike. Like, I can't hike here, like june-ish through mid-september because it's so hot the bugs are insane um so that's i look forward to that cooling off when i can actually kind of get out there uh, a little bit but adventure hydrology let's start there like why did you start this account this page uh and what's it all about yeah so adventure hydrology on youtube I, i'm sorry adventure hydrology on instagram but my brother and i are also we're twins and so we have a YouTube channel called The Twins Wolf. Wolf 
being my last name and, and yeah. coincidentally his. Um, <laughs> what, what kind of started it is the need to really be able to tell stories about the environment in a way that is unique, in a way that uses a different lens than regular storytelling. And what we say is actually we use the lens of adventure. And so that's kind of our, our catch. That's the thing that makes telling stories about our environment and what's happening to our environment a little bit uh, sexier, if, if I can even put it that way, because it, it's got to be exciting. It's got to be fun. And so what we do, what we try to do is tell stories while we have fun. Or to be honest, sometimes it, it can be a little miserable um, running across the Grand Canyon twice or freezing my butt off crossing the Arctic Circle or um, going diving in La Jolla to check out the kelp forests that are kind of, you know, in peril because of warming ocean temperatures, but then also recognizing that there may be some sharks in there. It, it kind of, pun intended, eats at you a little bit. And and when we're on these adventures, we kind of try to be raw and can't really plan what's going to happen in, in the woods, in the wild, in the environment. And so we recognize that and just try to have a great time, but then come back and make sure that we're, we're trying to tell the story of each one of these ecosystems and how climate is affecting them or how people have affected them and hopefully to enlighten people in a way to show that we can we can do something about it that mm. we can change the now for the future and really reverse all the damage that that we've done because in our opinion the world our ecosystems the environment is is searching for equilibrium and we have kind of thrown that off people and if we just empower the world to do what it does and find that balance, then I think there'll be a more harmonious way to kind of cope with uh, the ravages that we're going to see or we've been, been seeing from climate change. And so yeah. that's kind of the pitch. Let's, let's go explore the world and tell the stories using the lens of adventure. Yeah, yeah. I like that you pointed out that some of it is about the misery, right? Like you to to go on adventures, you're going to hit some of that, uh, whether it's getting up like in the dark to go drive to your destination or you guys hiking up these like the 14ers, right? The 14,000 foot mountains that are out there in Colorado uh, or being caught in the pouring rain or the pounding snow. I, I list all those because I've seen them all <laughs> on your on your channel as I follow along. But that's like that's part of the uh, the part of the fun of the adventure. It is misery, but like you embrace that though, right? Absolutely. I I call it type three fun. There's type one, <laughs> type two. I think we've all heard of both of those. Type three is you you kind of almost hug hug the misery. You mm -hmm. you embrace it for sure and just yeah. recognize that. If you're prepared, you can get through it, but it's going to take a, a mental, mental challenge, a mental, the mental tenacity to get through it. And then for some reason, this is the type three, you, you keep going back and maybe a different environment, whether that's a, a desert environment or a, a Arctic environment or everything in between in a very literal sense. Mm -hmm. And um, it just kind of makes it fun. And I, I truly enjoy kind of pushing myself to the limit. And there's some times that I, I think you'll see us break down i i <laughs> want to make it as real as possible because adventure needs to be real because the environment is what's happening to our world is is real and so we just try to be ourselves the real people the real adventurers the real twins the the fun people that we are and, yeah. and we bring you along for the adventure I definitely, uh, you know, plan to get out to Colorado at some point. We talked about this. I, I hope to go on one of those adventures with you. And then I hope at some point you can come to the coast of North Carolina and we can go hydrology exploring in a different environment too. Um, be I'm definitely going to take you up on that, Travis. Yeah, yeah. So Colorado, it's one of the two states, if I get this right, where all the water flows out. Is that right? Like there's no rivers flowing in? It's all outward? I, I believe there are two rivers that do not originate in Colorado that kind okay. of cut through Colorado. Okay. Um, but yeah, for the most part, Colorado is, is the headwater state for 40 million people if you're talking West Coast, but with Trans Mountain Diversions, something where mm. uh, water is pumped under the Continental Divide and, and flows unnaturally thanks to people to say the cities of Denver or Colorado Springs, or in the case of um, you know, kind of the way the water eventually flows, literally to the Gulf of Mexico, where historically it would not have flowed. And so, yeah, it's, it's kind of uh, a goofy paradigm in the sense that we've 
adjusted the environment, the ecosystems to really support uh, us, civilization. And it makes sense. But at the same time, yeah, Colorado is, is definitely the epicenter of, of a lot of water focused events, a lot of uh, water focused fights. And the Colorado River in particular is is ripe for for change. And, and um, you know, that's that's kind of the, the game that I'm trying to play now in my professional life is to to essentially save the Colorado, um, the Rio Grande and and everything that really kind of flows out of Colorado, the San Juan, yeah. all, all the rivers. Yeah, I think the other state that I'm thinking of is Hawaii, because, of course, wow. that that water's got nowhere uh, else to go. That's it. It falls on Hawaii, goes into the ocean. So, um, yep. yeah, I, I should maybe I'll get that question on Jeopardy one day. Who knows? Um, so, <laughs> so hydrology. Are you a hydrologist by training then, or I just kind of okay? Yeah, by training, by profession. Um, I, I I think everybody's a hydrologist. Mm. I say that a lot. Everything is water, from the food we eat to the clothes we're wearing to the computers that we're having this conversation through because all those things require some input of water. So even though people aren't necessarily studying it or managing it or building programs to save it or conserve it, everyone deals with water. And um, as, as I frequently say, I've said to you, I hydrologize, <laughs> but that, that means I do a lot of different things. I think everybody hydrologizes. Uh, when you drink water, I, I think you're hydrologizing, so to speak. Um, but yes, I do have a background an education and, and the professional experience as a hydrologist, worn a lot of different hats, and it's prepared me kind of for for what what we're trying to do in the West, and that's really save water. Yeah. So through your adventures, um, what are some of the things you've seen, uh, you know, that really stand out to you that you've just seen firsthand when you've been out there rafting, hiking, you know, biking, camping, whatever it might be, especially you know around Colorado. Sure. Yeah, I've, uh, I've, I've seen nearly every aspect of the Colorado River uh, and a lot of its tributaries from rafting the gates of Lador, the Green River, to the mm. confluence of the Colorado, to rafting the Colorado River itself in different sections, Upper Colorado, Lower Colorado, some of the tributaries in Arizona, Verde River, Salt River. Um, I've, also, I've also been to where the Colorado River dies and it's... It's, it's not where you think, maybe, or maybe where, where people don't really hear about it. And it's, it's Prezos Morales. It's, uh, it's a dam that is more or less on the border of the United States and Mexico. And the United States utilizes so much water of the Colorado that Mexico doesn't get that much when it, when it finally reaches the international border. But at this beautiful junction, there's this dam. And the, the river itself is, is finally diverted uh, the last time out of its bank, so it doesn't reach the mm. Sea of Cortez, where it had historically created one of the most prolific and uh, wildlife diverse estuaries in the entire world ever. Um, and it's it's a beautiful sight. I was down there with some colleagues from the Sonoran Institute Pro Naturo mm. Noroeste, and it's gorgeous. But it, it's really where the Colorado River is is um, well, it ends, and mm. it's. It's beautiful and sad simultaneously, but but I think the saddest part is that the people don't recognize that's where it ends, that they've never seen it, and it's so close to Phoenix or San Diego or, heck, L.A., and there's millions of people in L.A. that don't, don't realize that, one, they're drinking water from the Colorado River in some capacity, um, or at least eating food that's, that's irrigated from the Colorado River, but also that haven't experienced this landscape that if you just add water, um, comes back like Laguna Grande. Great example. It's um, a desert estuary that's been kind of restored, and and historically the Colorado River used to kind of fill these areas, and and wildlife would come back. And so I think you know, that's the place that I, I can picture in my head that resonates with me the most because mm. when we add water back to the environment, uh, especially in the Colorado River Basin, you see. The, the wildlife, the, the world that is, is fed by this water along the riparian corridors come back to life because it, it's used to that. That's, that's what it has done historically before we were here. And um, that's, that's kind of the place from the headwaters to the end. You know, I've, I've been in between, but that's the place that, that kind of sings to me because yeah. one day I really like to restore that. It kind of encompasses uh, 
the whole story in a way, right? It that's that's like the piece that shows what has happened to this whole watershed. It, it how agriculture uses so much water, the people use so much water. It's been diverted and dammed, and and that's kind of like summarizes that's the outcome right the ultimate outcome right there um and i remember hearing about some releases of water that were done so that colorado did flow again just down in mexico and those communities that were by that just were able to celebrate uh the water being there again um you know it seemed like a great justice for them to at least have that experience and you certainly would hope that that can be the permanent situation one day that's tough. I want to ask you about uh, your journey to the Arctic Circle, um, you know, and what that was like, and especially maybe what you learned about water as part of that journey. Sure. Yeah, I, I was fortunate to join 19 other wonderful people uh, on this international coalition to kind of explore the Arctic via dog sled um, over six days, which was was pretty Pretty crazy to be selected. Um, I want to just shout out to Fjall Raven. Uh, the, it's a Swedish clothing brand, very sustainable oriented. They invited me to join. And I would say, you know, kind of seeing what's happening in the Arctic just is, is kind of similar to what I see happening in the mountains of Colorado. Mm. And that is a warming climate. The ice is melting. The permafrost is, is thawing. And you can see the, the changes in the environment. It's um, warmer, it's subtle, but it's mm. happening. And so going to a place like the Arctic Circle, I think it was 200 kilometers above the Arctic Circle actually, and watching the Northern Lights and crossing via dog sled without a sound, uh, except the pitter patter of six dogs and all their feet. Um, and it wasn't really a pitter patter, it was, it was a silent loud. Yeah. Um, but to kind of see that and to see how the Scandinavian countries and, and Sweden and Norway in particular are kind of dealing with sea level rise and climate change and melting fjords and glaciers and all, all the scary stuff that is happening that much faster towards our poles and to kind of connect those dots between what's happening in my backyard and uh, now some of my friends' backyard. But it, it was truly an amazing experience and I'm looking forward to doing more adventures like that. Um, mm. But you see that everywhere, even on top of Kilimanjaro, which is is uh, soon to be one of the adventures coming out because those glaciers are going to go away and they may never come back. Wow. Last adventure hydrology thing, I guess, and we'll just transition to some other questions. So, you, you know, Colorado famous for its skiing, right? Um, you, you know, you mentioned that's something you do. Of course, so many people, even from the East Coast where I live, they're like going to Colorado, going to Utah, whatever, hitting the Rockies. Um I know there's that organization Protect Our Winters, and they're trying to fight climate change because of the importance. Um, in your time in Colorado, have you seen changes in, you know, the snowfall, in the length of the winter skiing season, and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, the the trick is, at least for me, that that I've been in Colorado for a long enough time that I can see the seasons be a little little different. Snow falls mm -hmm. a little later melts a little faster. Um, spring runoff, when it's whitewater rafting season, happens for a shorter period of time because of that. It's, it's more intense. Mm. But um, one of the things that, that I think is, is really happening is you're, you're kind of losing the consistent snowpack. It's hit or miss. Some seasons are, are great. This year, was, it was okay. You know, people are really excited in some basins, but, but where I lived, it was kind of an average snowpack. Um, and that's kind of scary because we need above average to really fill the reservoirs or to ensure that the soil is moist enough. Um, snowpack is, is our biggest reservoir in the entire country, the entire world actually. And I've, I've seen firsthand how it's kind of starting to go away. You have to uh, veil one of my favorite resorts that I've, I've skied and I, I live in that valley, would have to make snow so that people could actually ski from top to bottom. And that didn't really have to happen. And I've seen that a couple of times and I've had to navigate around some dirt on the way down at the end of the season, um, even after a snowfall, because it just melts so fast and at higher elevations too, which is kind of the scariest because that's the higher elevation um, is where the snow stays the longest. And if that melts quick, then we are changing the hydrologic processes of our rivers. And that means uh, the fish are being affected and the wildlife are being affected and migration patterns and 
and all the scary things that, that they have to deal with that maybe we as people don't recognize because we're, we're kind of changing the environment or, or adapting the river's regime to kind of fit this new normal. And, and to me, that's terrifying as I, I don't want these things to be a new normal because mm. it shouldn't be normal. Um, yeah. At least not in my opinion that I think, yeah. I think we can do better. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, all right, shifting gears here. Uh, so you worked uh, Eagle Creek? Uh, Eagle Creek, water and sanitation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, tell me about that. And I'm really interested, especially in kind of efforts around water conservation and, and what happened and what, what kind of your work was there. Sure. Uh, while I was at Eagle River Water and Sanitation District, it's located in Vail, Colorado. Wonderful organization, great people, uh, really kind of leading the charge in the headwaters of the Eagle River, a tributary of the Colorado. So that gives you a little context of where we're talking about. And because it's it's high in elevation and kind of the first ones to use this water, the district, as I call it, we call it, has an opportunity um, to really kind of change the paradigm on how water is managed at these headwater levels. So one of the things that I was in charge of is the conservation program. And part of that is to help people, one, uh, understand the value of water, but then also not just understand it, but but change their behaviors. And so one of the really amazing things that we worked on while, while I was at the, the district is a water budget program that really focused on using science and plant water requirements, how much water a plant requires. I know, simple explanation. <laughs> um, but then using evaporation rates and transpiration rates, transpiration is tree sweat, essentially, the easiest way I can explain it. And putting those together and saying how much water must a landscape need based upon a plant profile over X amount of square feet based on water rights, um, very complicated really cool science, but then applying that to people and get, saying, hey, you have a 5,000 square foot yard of bluegrass, which you really shouldn't have at 7,000 feet, much less 9,000 feet, and they do exist up there. Hmm. Um, but, but then telling people or giving people the, the ability to recognize that their yard doesn't need as much water as they've put on historically, and that water that they use is directly tied to the health of the river. And that's why people are there, is for the skiing, for the rafting, for the fishing, and so connecting those dots through science is, is kind of what I do through adventure hydrology as well. Mm. But in this case, it's, it's the professional side. It's, it's the fun thing I get paid to do while I was at the district and establish these programs, groundbreaking, pioneering, however it can be described. Um, those aren't my words. Uh, well, maybe they are. But, <laughs> but I think it's really exciting to be able to use science to help people recognize the value of water. And, and that's one of the big charges that that I and the district uh, led while I was there. Yeah, sure. So what what was the uptake or, you know, the level of education that was kind of achieved or is being achieved, right? There's been an increased awareness of the situation in Colorado and throughout the basin. Uh, there's been an increased awareness of like, hey, maybe I need to change my landscaping and so forth. What, uh, what how did things trend in that in that valley there? When it comes to the valley, it's it's really you have to look at the demographics, mm. and and I would say that a lot of people that visit the valley aren't necessarily living in the valley, or there's a lot of second homeowners that live somewhere else where where perhaps water is more abundant. So you really have to focus on those homeowners, maybe the top twenty percent of people that are just not intentionally overusing water or wasting water, but just maybe wouldn't know better. Um, so really engaging them required going out and just talking to people, hosting events, working with partners throughout the Valley to hone messages and to have this collaborative approach. Because I don't think one organization can, can do it together. I think we all need to be speaking with a unified voice to ensure that we're protecting the most important resource, in my opinion, and super biased uh, water <laughs> yeah. on the planet. And so I, I just want to thank everybody that, that really has, has contributed to these projects and programs and that are still I say fighting the good fight to get just the word out there because that's the first step. Um, and so I think, yeah. I think it's been pretty darn effective, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, while in the, the time that I was there, I, I forget the exact numbers, but we had saved already um, some tens of 
hundreds of acre feet or something similar uh, with some pretty audacious goals set for the future. And so I'm excited to see what the district is doing now that I've kind of uh, passed the water conservation torch to, to my friends and colleagues up there. And I look forward to chatting with them here soon, but um, I'm, I'm hoping to, to go back and, and see the results of, of all of our hard work as an organization, as a team. And, you know, it's something I'm very passionate about. So, so excited yeah. to go back. Before we talk about your new gig, uh, what's an acre foot of water? Because, uh, you know, I think a lot of you, you uh, Colorado River Basin folks, you got that in your heads. A lot of us, especially everybody east of the Mississippi, were like, what? <laughs> so could you explain that for people? Yeah, sorry. My, my Sometimes I, I get into the water lingo, assuming everyone knows what, what crazy words we use. Uh, <laughs> an acre foot of water, I believe, is 365,800 and something gallons. Okay. Um, I'm, I may have missed that. I haven't had to calculate that in a while. Um, essentially an acre foot, if you picture a football field, is one foot of water spread across a football field from end zone to end zone, sideline to sideline. Um, it's, it's a lot of water, surprisingly enough. And, and it's actually somewhere around uh, enough water to keep a family of four doing all the things that they do at home, domestic water use for an entire year. Okay. So one acre foot is, is me and you and two of our friends living in a house together, um, eating food, you know, drinking water, doing all the things that the domestic use entails. And then um, if you want to picture it, it's a, a bunch of gallons of milk across a football field. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's super plastic. Yeah, that's a super helpful way to explain it, though, like that, that football field, cover it a foot deep. That's an acre foot of water. Yeah, because every time I hear about negotiations around the river and this agreement and that agreement, that's kind of how it's always phrased. So very helpful. Um, yeah. So you're now with Quantified Ventures, uh, well, I think an awesome organization focused on innovation uh, and coming up with just totally new ways to do things, uh, especially financing uh, water projects. Could you talk a bit about your work with them and, and what's happening in the Colorado River Basin with Quantified Ventures? Sure. I'm at, I'm at Quantified Ventures where I am currently the Associate Director and Watershed Coordinator of the Colorado River Basin. And so what we do is we are really focused on leveraging resources and innovative financing and, and funding approaches that are taking really advantage of all the money that is coming down from the federal level. So that's Bill and IRA, and please don't ask me the acronyms right now, um, bipartisan infrastructure legislation, boom, there's Bill. And, and all the grants and all the funding that is really going in to save the Colorado and to uh, focus on collaboration and to ensure that the reservoirs that are in peril are sustained and that people are conserving. And so what, what my job is, what I'm in charge of doing is really kind of leading these efforts to bring people together and to find these innovative pathways with my colleagues to essentially, and it's no easy task, but to save the Colorado River and, and everything associated with that's the economy, um, that's farming, that's the livelihoods of of the people that, that live in the basin itself. It's the cities, it's the environment. And so what we're really trying to do at Quantified Ventures is leverage all of our resources in the conservation finance world and focus them to solving what is perhaps the biggest problem in the Southwest in, um, in American history. I, I don't know, maybe human history. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's uh, an exciting time to be a part of this organization and, and it's great to be within this this team that is really focused on innovation and and disrupting really what what the status quo was to ensure that the future can can be what it needs to be yeah i love how they do that uh there's great examples around the country of them setting up these different environmental impact bonds right kind of coming up with this mechanism to get to get funding in a different way. And I am fully confident that things like that are gonna happen out there uh, with you involved and that whole Quantified Ventures team. Uh, I look forward to following that for sure. Um, I wanna ask about, uh, you mentioned, you said agriculture, you know, um, and ag uses what, 80% of the water. Um, and so I guess a big focus for Quantified Ventures and the other partners is, is really trying to 
crack that nut, if you will, right? Like, how can we how can we get this water managed better? So agriculture does use approximately 80% of all the water within the Colorado River Basin. Now that, that changes dependent on the environmental situation at hand, if we have a good monsoon, et cetera, et cetera. But what we're really trying to do is, is focus on innovative ways to help farmers continue to farm. We don't want to do buy and dry strategies. We don't see that as necessarily a pathway to really support the economies and the livelihoods of, of the American farmers in the Southwest. And so what we're really, really trying to do is focus on the environmental benefits, the outcomes of perhaps changing uh, crop types, or what if we can uh, help a farmer leverage its resources so in a, in a manner that it doesn't require uh, as much irrigation. Maybe it's a seasonal change or um, finding innovative financing ways to leverage uh, federal resources, state resources to implement nature-based solutions that are a little less of the gray infrastructure that we're used to, um, water treatment plants and wastewater facilities, and instead focus those efforts to restore wetlands and, and hold water for a longer time and then associate those water rights in a way that, that perhaps leverages it not only for a farmer, but for downstream users and maybe as important, if not more important, the environment and, and people that rely on it itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Chris, uh, I really, like I said in the beginning, I'm glad we finally got to have this conversation. I feel like we can go on and on, but we will do this uh, surf and turf style in the in the months, year ahead, whatever it might be. I look forward to kind of doing some of this content with you up there in Colorado and you coming to the coast of North Carolina. But uh, in the meantime, I am going to keep enjoying your adventures on Instagram. I, again, encourage everybody to follow Adventure Hydrology. Such good stuff. Uh, good content, wholesome content, the stuff we need. But Chris, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you, Travis. Truly a pleasure, as always, to hang out with you virtually. I can't wait to wear in person. And yes, let's surf and turf. Uh, you, you teach me how to ride some hurricane waves, and I'll teach you how to hit the water. I love it. I love it. Thanks, buddy. See ya. All right, thanks. See ya. Waterloop. Thank you for listening to the episode, and thanks to sponsor Flume. Please check them out at flumewater.com. To find all podcasts, sign up for email updates, and connect on social media, visit waterloop.org.